morning. Uh, in order to be able to hear us today, you need to choose uh, channel one. We just got this information from uh, the, um, the technical uh, assistance team. Uh, so good morning once again. My uh, name is um, Julia Morenets from Together Against Cybercrime. I will have a pleasure to uh, open uh, this workshop, 168. Uh, and actually during this, yeah, there are some technical problems. You hear? Yeah, okay. So and uh, during this workshop, we uh, will try to understand, to understand and to discuss all together, I hope, how to better involve vulnerable people uh, in the building process of information society in order to um, to become, in order to give them the possibility to become active actors of this information society. So um, I will have a pleasure to commandeerate this workshop together with my colleague, uh, Mr. Zahid Jamil, uh, from um, the Developing Country Center on Cybercrime. And I would like to thank Zahid for having accepted to be here today. Um, well, I would like to, uh, um, before uh, let's an introduction, I would like to say that it's the third year actually that we organize Attack Together Against Cybercrime, a workshop here um, uh, in IGF on the subject of uh, vulnerable people and ICTs. The first year, uh, actually, we had a workshop on the um, ICTs, use of ICTs by migrants and people with migrant background. So we tried to see how to integrate these mul uh, migrant groups in the information society and the building process of the information society. And as a result of this uh, first workshop in Vilnius, we, um, uh, we developed a, a EU-funded project uh, called eSprint, and the result of the EU-funded project eSprint was the, a developed online training for local authorities' representatives uh, on the use of ICTs uh, by migrants and people with migrant background and um, in order to better integrate them in the society. Uh, so the second year, in Nairobi, we also had uh, um, a workshop, but it was a wider discussion. It was a discussion on ICTs and vulnerable groups. So the results of this workshop are still ongoing. And this year, we would like actually, well, I hope all together, speak and understand ex how, to, how to do, how to integrate uh, now these uh, vulnerable groups and what to do. Um, so uh, just uh, as the point of conclusion, I would like to say that um, Zahid and myself, we do work uh, mostly on cybercrime and cybersecurity issues. But this workshop is not on cybercrime or on cybersecurity, even we, if we do have a link between cybersecurity, cybercrime, and vulnerable groups. Because obviously, uh, I have to say, um, when we speak about vulnerable groups, they are more fragile with regard of the internet dangers and threats. And so it's how we uh, arrived and um, ended um, uh, to, um, on this subject. So I will let Zahid now to the very much. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, uh, Yulia, for uh, uh, requesting us uh, to assemble the panelists also and, and myself as co-moderator. I wanted to sort of begin by introducing um, uh, basically the, the, the various panelists. So we have Wolf Ludwig. He's at Uralo in ICANN, but he's also with the ICANN Academy. So we look forward to hearing what basically they may have to contribute. We have Khaled Fatal joining us from a developing country. He's with uh, Multilingual Internet Group, and we look forward to seeing how that will impact uh, you know, marginalized or otherwise uh, vulnerable groups. We also have Danielle de Groot. She is with the police in Netherlands, and uh, she's a council of chiefs of the police, and basically we'll be hearing from her how they, they handle these issues from a, from a cybercrime perspective. We also have Lara Pace. She's with ComNet, uh, and very sort of active participant in the CIGF, and, and has done a lot of work on uh, child protection, for instance. We'll hear from her as well. We have uh, uh, Barbara, uh, who's here from uh, the OECD, Barbara Obaldi. And uh, she works as a project leader on e-government, public governance, and territorial development. We'll be hearing from her. And we have Stuart Hamilton here from the International Federation of Library Association Institute. And you wonder what that has to do with it. But they have programs, and we would, we're would looking forward to hearing what, they ha what they're doing with vulnerable people as well. So uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. And uh, if there are any problems, please raise your hands if you can't hear anything. Um, I'm too soft. I need to be a little. Oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you for telling me. Yes. So if I'm if I'm if I'm too soft or if you can't hear anything, you have any technical problems, please please raise your hands and <coughs> let us know. Um, 
also uh, I just want to repeat uh, basically the point that Yulia made that uh, we are all, most of us sort of very interested in cybercrime and cybersecurity. Uh, myself, Yulia, I know Lara and many others and also from the police, but the focus of this workshop, we, we want to sort of keep it very narrow and make sure we get results from this is basically uh, to focus on the uh, effe effect and the capacity building for better economic and social inclusion of uh, vulnerable people in the wishes context, etc. So uh, we look forward to hearing what, what you have to say about that. Uh, with that, uh, we will uh, go to the first uh, uh, participant and uh, uh, I'll ask Yulia to sort of lead into the first question if that's okay. Yeah. We need to change the mic actually to be <laughs> to be ready for <laughs> one of us can speak. Um, can I just, um, in order to, to be clear, and uh, the definition we use when we speak about vulnerable people, because it can be a wide discussion also on the definition, I would like to raise, as uh, um, Zahid just was uh, underlying, uh, we do use the definition proposed by the, by the uh, Geneva Declaration of Principles uh, made during the WISIS process, and uh, I we prepared, and I don't know if you will be able to see, but we prepared the second slide with the definition just to be here and to be sure um, what is the definition we use. Um, can I ask someone, I don't know, maybe Halet, to just to change the slide and to, to put on the second page? Can be possible? Thank you so much. So now we have this definition. Um, what I wanted to, I would like to ask with this question and with the discussion um, I heard during the consultation meeting um, of IGF in February of this year, a number of people were saying, you know, um, vulnerable people and ICTs, and inclusion of vulnerable people, it's so old subject, do we? we? We don't really need to speak about today. So my question I would like to, to, to ask Wolf, because he has a great experience as a journalist and a project manager working with vulnerable groups, with migrants. Actually, do we need to continue the discussion on the inclusion of vulnerable people? Um, in the information society today. Uh, thanks for the question, uh, Julia. I think uh, the question is out of question uh, that we need to continue uh, to, to work with vulnerable groups. Uh, we can discuss about the de uh, definition. Whether the definition uh, uh, we have from the Geneva process, from the principle uh, declaration of principles uh, 10 years ago and uh, the action lines at that time, I think in certain respects some progress was made over the last 10 years regarding inclusion, digital inclusion in some countries. We cannot generalize this. But in certain European uh, countries, a lot of progress was made, having more portions of society included over the last couple of years. Uh, for some of the groups we discussed 10 years ago, it was partly a self-supporting mechanism. So digital tools became more and more popular and uh, due to the fact many, many more people got access to it. And we couldn't have imagined 10 years ago that billions now of people would be on the internet already. Therefore, I think we still have to be careful with the term vulnerable people. I think it's not the same concept we may have had in mind uh, 10 years ago. To my knowledge, still existing access barriers are education and income. Not only in the country where I live, not only in Western European countries, but in a far broader context. Education and income are the predominant factors or access barriers what still exist and if we s start on this level now I think we have to clearly do something in regard of this people this population groups to empower them in a way that they can actively participate in the digital society, in the information society, and there is still a strong need. And these uh, people, let's take the migrants, 
in my country, in Switzerland or even in Germany, these are still the groups who are at the edge of entering into. They may use mobile tools more than other tools or platforms on the internet. And I think as, uh, assistance programs for these groups are still needed. Thank you so much, Wolf. Practically, you you do answer uh, the, the the question. If uh, what, what you're saying mainly is, um, we do need to speak to continue the discussion on what uh, of the on the definition of vulnerable due to the technical progress and different regional uh, national specificities, and uh, do continue to include vulnerable people uh, and empower them with the new knowledges. And actually, our workshop is about how to empower them in order to include in the information society. Uh, what is the, could be the point of view from multinational perspective? And I uh, would like to ask you, Barbara, um, you are from OECD. Um, from the multinational perspective, do we need to continue the discussion? What is your, um, in order to compare views? Certainly, the answer is positive. It's positive uh, because we see in the practice that even if many progresses have been made when it comes to reducing the digital exclusion, to increase the inclusion, there are still significant um, segments of the population which are vulnerable groups uh, which uh, face barriers of different kind which are still excluded. And we see this especially as new technologies come on board and are embraced by governments to uh, add channels for the delivery of services, for instance, and to engage um, citizens more broadly, more uh, um, uh, actively in policy making and service delivery, we see that this, on one side, enhances the opportunities provided to citizens, but on the other side, um, emphasizes the um, possibilities to creating new forms of exclusion or to intensify the exclusion of specific groups of the population. And I'm thinking of this, particularly also in relation to the um, increasing importance of uh, mobile government. I'm thinking of this as uh, social media become in the uh, priority list of governments uh, important channels to deliver information and, and potentially services. And I'm thinking um, as uh, open government these initiatives uh, become more and more important in the strategies of governments to actually uh, provide data which can enable the delivery of services which serve particular groups of the population. So the answer is certainly uh, yes. You make me actually very happy personally with my uh, with what I think that we need do need to continue the discussion and I'm pr practically well. I hope I'm, sh I'm that other people will um, uh, have the same opinion as I have. I'll um taking the discussion forward a little bit and maybe look at some regional areas. Uh, Laura, you uh, work with the uh, the Commonwealth. You have a Comnet uh, uh, as as an, as an NGO. And there's a lot of stuff that you do is in the Commonwealth IGF context as well. So, uh, how do you see or uh, feel that you know you, you could better facilitate participation of vulnerable people uh, from the Commonwealth countries um, uh, in this information society? And and how do you feel that the CIGF can play a role? Thank you, Zaid. Um, good morning. My name is Lara. I work for the Comnet Foundation, and. Um, as he pointed out, we run the Commonwealth IGF and the Commonwealth Cybercrime Initiative. Um, the Commonwealth IGF is a discussion space, so what we do is we distribute information on a number of areas relating to internet governance. Uh, we publish toolkits that can be adopted by the, the member states and civil society within the Commonwealth. And, uh, for example, at this IGF, we have tried to set up as many remote hubs as possible to enable um, participation at this IGF. But as such, the Commonwealth doesn't, do doesn't have specific programs for vulnerable people. We, we, we target the whole Commonwealth uh, in a broad, broad uh, sense. So I think what we can do is, uh, uh, what I'm hoping from this uh, workshop is that we can collaborate further with Yulia and create specific uh, exercises that can engage further vulnerable people in the Commonwealth. 
so that's that's very interesting. I, I just wanted to follow up, if, if I may, with, with two other points. You know, should we should we think about maybe in, in say in the Commonwealth and other contexts, for instance, to think about the development of national strategies uh, on the inclusion of vulnerable people in information society? Maybe the Commonwealth could do something like that. And and I also note the fact that even though they don't specifically have programs in the Commonwealth, but the fact that you deal with um, small island states, that you deal with indigenous people, which is not necessarily the same thing, but can actually sort of uh, speak to what Wolf was mentioning: people who may be on the edge and need to, because of economy and other income issues, be brought into the sphere. Uh, so maybe they do, do have a lot of very interesting and very helpful programs within the Commonwealth to, uh, with, with respect to that. But coming back to my earlier question, do you think that your national strategies in this area could, could help and how could the Commonwealth, do you think, play a role? Yeah, um, through the Commonwealth Cybercrime Initiative, basically what the initiative is, is um, uh, assisting Commonwealth member states in drafting a uh, national strategy to address cybercrime. And we also assist with the subsequent impl implementation of that. And um, within that very broad encompassing strategy that addresses institutional, uh, legal, uh, human capacity, I think it would, it, it would also encompass the, the, the engagement of vulnerable people through that. So yes, I definitely agree with national um, uh, strategies. And in, in a sense, that is what we're trying to do. Um, so yeah, national strategies, definitely. Thank you, Laura. It was, uh, it was very interesting what you mentioned, that uh, remote participation um, is uh, one of the very important points. And um, remote participation could empower, I say, and is through the vulnerable groups and uh, to better include them in the information society. And actually, we do have a remote moderator here. It's uh, Roxana Rado. I, um, I would like to introduce her. And I think we have remote participants as well. So um, please, if uh, there is a question or in intervention, uh, just let us know. and. Um, I will be happy to have uh, your statement. Um, I would like to, we have uh, Stuart with, with us from International uh, Federation of Libraries uh, uh, Associations. And I would like to ask you, Stuart, um, you work a lot with uh, different uh, groups, uh, with different groups of citizens and including vulnerable groups. And how can uh, we allow these vulnerable groups uh, to participate in the development of capacity building uh, initiatives? Well, thank you very much for inviting me to be here. Um, yeah, I can imagine why there might be a, a question as to why libraries are here. But actually, that shouldn't really be a question at all. There's over one billion registered library users on the planet. So if you can imagine, that's a fairly significant um, sector. And IFLA, my organization, has members in over 150 countries worldwide. So serving vulnerable populations is just something that libraries do and in fact we always have done it goes back to the beginning of the public library service where we were actually increasing access to information for those who couldn't afford to buy books couldn't afford to get access to information so with the advent of the internet access to digital information sources of course this is completely updated and we have um, members libraries all around the world engaging in different sorts of projects to let people in I looked at the definition of vulnerable people with, with great interest to sort of apply it to, to where we're working. Uh, one of our partners, uh, Electronic Information for Libraries, IFL, uh, are running a fantastic program uh, looking at innovation in public libraries. And that has actually given us a ton of examples of libraries working in this area. So for example, in Bulgaria, the library services are helping the long-term unemployed find work through partnerships with um, employment agencies. In Croatia, in Zagreb, the city libraries have an employment training program for the homeless. So we're very much at the cutting edge with these library programs. We can reach out further. If you look at Kenya, there's a program that's reaching out to slum youth to help them improve their marks. Now we're going a little bit into youth services, but nevertheless the overall concept is the same. And this program seeks to look at the models for these projects and seeks to scale them up. With just a small bit of investment, they can be replicated elsewhere. But the way that we help these groups become stakeholders is really to help them help themselves. Uh, yesterday, my colleague uh, from Romania was on a, uh, a panel we organized about libraries and public access. Because at the very basis of this, vulnerable groups aren't going to be walking around with a laptop under their arm. They're not going to have an iPad in their rucksack. 
they need to have public access to ICTs. And it's public libraries that actually offer that free of charge with expertise. But what he said in this panel was, um, it's not really about training these people to use computers. You can't say, come into the library and learn how to use a computer. People aren't interested. If you say, come into the library and we'll help you get a job, then people come in for that action and they learn how to use the computers and they build on it from there. So the public library system, and there are sort of about 230,000 public libraries worldwide, all of which are integrated into government budget lines, integrated into the system. These are trusted institutions. And I think they really should be used a lot more to provide services at the cutting edge for these vulnerable groups. So I'm lucky enough to have a ton of examples in front of me which I can share further. But those programs that I mentioned in Zagreb, in Africa, there's many of those going on around the world. Thank you, Stuart. That's, that's extremely helpful. And, and what I've sort of explains is that it, it's about actually not only including them in the information society, but actually becoming sort of a, a vehicle where they can actually find real life examples of or, or opportunities. So, so very, very important. Uh, staying on the issue of capacity building, for instance, uh, uh, Khalid, uh, y you've done a lot of work in the developing countries, especially in, in enabling an IDN space as multilingualism. Um, uh, how would how do you think we could allow vulnerable people to participate in the development of you know capacity building initiatives in the developing countries themselves? Uh, thank you, Zahid, and uh, thank you for uh, for inviting me to be on this panel. I um, first I have a confession to make, and probably it's a compliment to you what you guys are doing. Um, the confession is, I was really not very fully aware of the initiatives that you are doing in, in advancing the agenda for vulnerable people. Um, and the fact that I am becoming aware that you are doing this, that there's been a, a, few, um, a few IGFs now under your belt, it just shows me perhaps one of the positive signs of what comes out of IGF which is that sense of maturity that we can deal with specific subjects because we're deal we have already handled bigger picture things. Now we're dealing with the minute detail. So by drawing this picture to all of you here, uh, let me just share with you the, what I would call not just developing world, let's, say, let's refer to them as emerging markets because this probably relates to a lot of countries in the emerging markets. Um, Issues pertaining to um, vulnerable people, let's say, in the Western Hemisphere are probably, to a large extent, subgroup within society. They're probably the minority. Uh, I stand to be corrected if I'm wrong. In, in terms of enabling, in terms of capacity building, in terms of developing inclusion, participation, uh, empowering, when you start talking about ICT in emerging markets, you can start looking at the majority of these communities are vulnerable people. So you see how all of a sudden now the game changes. So the maturity we have in the internet space, like we're hearing examples of how, for example, you're creating remote participation and, um, and access, uh, the concept of the libraries, I think there may be some lessons that can be learned of what has been implemented uh, uh, so far in, in developing uh, markets that could be, I don't want to use the word translated, but that could be utilized as a practice which won't only help vulnerable people, but may help m the majority of the citizens in the emerging markets who can be defined as vulnerable people because they haven't had access. Second chance to add something else. Um, when you create hubs and you want people to come and participate, well, the first most obvious thing, you expect them to be able to communicate in a language that they can communicate in. Now we're talking about multilingualism. We've been pushing on this for the last decade and a half. And these are some of the challenges. So while we're dealing with issues that are of relevance to what may look like minorities within Western Hemisphere Internet, these are majority. Uh, groups in emerging markets and if we're able to address this and show some uh, positive signs or solutions 
I think the, the, the positiveness that will come out of this would be even more gigantic because it will be help, the help will be on much grander scale. And I, by the way, I, I, li I love your idea of um, what I would call leveraging the, um, um, the infrastructure of, of, of uh, uh, libraries. They're there. They're there. And it's, 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 it's a physical place. People know it exists. So that's probably the, in the infusion of old with new. So uh, by all means, my two cents. Funny. Um, well, actually, uh, the, the, like I have a bullet that was uh, taking notes. I think we will speak later on on um, multilanguage, which is very important issue and um, for vulnerable people, I believe, and for the um, better development of capacity building uh, programs and initiatives as well. What I'm saying practically is we shall keep and take what we have, what we developed already, and um, go forward, develop and implement other new initiatives in these developing countries or emerging markets, as you uh, called it. And uh, what uh, Stuart was saying, um, it's I, I just uh, got an idea. Actually, uh, the role of local authorities could be very important because for, for access, for the implementation even of programs, uh, national programs that you were uh, speaking about, um, and w I think it's very important that you underline that, that the empowerment of vulnerable groups uh, is very important for their social and economic uh, inclusion. As you tried, and I think it's a global theme of our IGF of course this year. If I can just comment briefly as well. I mean, when you're, I used to work in public libraries in the United Kingdom, and I used to work in my own hometown, which was, um, shall we say, a little bit of a victim of a government policy in the 80s called Care in the Community. Uh, the upshot of this policy was that many community centres ended up being closed between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. so that people could become more engaged in the community. Um, that may or may not have worked, <laughs> but what the upshot was that people, vulnerable people were, were shut out of where they lived during the day, during the winter, during the cold, and the public library is a place, for better or for worse, where these people can come. Um, and my own experience of working with these people was that, that there was a lot of help to give. But the public library is a trusted institution, and that I think is what we're getting at with the inclusion. Uh, we can run a lot of programs to bring vulnerable people into the information society, but we have to be careful. If we partner with the police authorities, which we can do and that sort of thing, we need to be careful And libraries just offer that trusted institution, which is already part of um, certainly government spending, government systems. So I think that there's a real element there that, that we're already in the system and we can really build on that to help. I think very, very important point as well. I don't know if, uh, Steph, if you have something to add. Uh, I would like um, to ask also Wolf. I know Wolf is um, um, closely involved, uh, well, he's the chair of Euralo, which is the, uh, uh, if he will introduce, uh, he will uh, explain himself. Uh, I can uh, Euralo, and um, he's closely involved in an initiative called I Can Academy, um, that he um, uh, that uh, at large is developing right now. So I would like to know. Um, I think this initiative is about uh, how to empower and to share knowledge, to bring knowledge to the I Can family actors. But what is the place of vulnerable groups in this uh, in this uh, specific uh, context? Um, can this initiative include or develop specific approach, or what do you think? What are your ideas? Well, uh, <coughs> let's say it's a good question. Uh, fir first, let me uh, shortly explain uh, Euralo. Uh, Euralo stands for European Regional at Large Organizations. It's one of the five pillars regional pillars of ICANN's at-large structure. At-large means the representation, the voice of the users at ICANN. So besides the governmental level, the uh, governmental ad advisory committee, besides uh, uh, business sector, GNSO, etc., it's the user part and the technical community it's a user representation at ICANN and it's an important part of the multi-stakeholder model at ICANN. Uh, representa uh, representing users or European uh, users at ICANN 
we have at large structures in many countries in 33 countries all, uh, all over Europe which is far from being complete but the whole system the RALO structure started five years ago so we are still at a starting point with user representation at ICANN there is still a lot of work to be done uh, coming back to uh, your question uh, Julia I wouldn't consider our at-large structure necessarily representing vulnerable people. Uh, with some exception, we have one member, e-seniors in France. We have TAC uh, working with these uh, people, but the majority of our members are ISOC chapters or civil rights organizations all over Europe but not particularly dealing with vulnerable groups. So the ICANN Academy program uh, is so far focused on people who are already capable to play on the national or international level. So these are the advanced portions of the population. They have uh, a solid uh, idea about uh, basics of internet governance. So this is almost a little bit the contrary of vulnerable groups. But under the ICANN Academy project, uh, ICANN Academy project is in a pilot state at the moment. And it's um, oriented to train new incoming leaders from the ICANN uh, community, whether they are GAC members, new GAC members, or new GNSO members, or new ELEC members, etc. But they have already a solid background in this respect. But the ICANN Academy idea includes another component, and this is now Im the important one, or the interesting one. It's capacity building on various levels. And when we talk about empowerment, and I uh, entirely agree uh, uh, with Stuart, we need to use existing structures, traditional structures, libraries, 100 years ago, were extremely important for the empowerment of the working class people. They were the crucial elements how to improve access to education systems, how to get uh, access for better careers, etc., how to get access to broader participation in the, uh, the uh, uh, process of uh, democratic societies, etc. And if we can reuse these access points in the digital age having this trust and having the possibilities that you have uh, 230,000 centers, uh, libraries as you said, worldwide so we would be rather stupid not to use it what could be an interesting option in this respect having a cooperation project with IFLA and offering capacity building programs with institutions like you or other institutions. So I think we, I just see uh, Anna uh, sitting here, uh, the telecenters existing in other countries. It's another network. So we do not have to reinvent any circles if we use existing infrastructures which are popular already and then what one of you clearly said not saying well we, t uh, we teach you how to uh, uh, use a computer we have to differently contextualize why it's so important being empowered having basic capacities for whatever purpose that comes out of it Different communities have different goals, have different interests. So there is no one-fits-all solution. So we have to look at these groups in with their particular needs. 
And this is one of the uh, of the good points what was mentioned in the Declaration of Principles already, that all of these groups have specific needs, and we won't find. Uh, Closing now and coming back to your question, Icon Academy is has also different target groups, but we learned in the last one and a half years while developing this uh, project that you cannot generalize an approach. You must have an idea. You must have a clear uh, understanding of your target group, and then you have to offer specific very specific programs for the uh, for the respective uh, uh, target group by existing uh, by uh, using existing infrastructures thank you so much Wolf. i think it's extremely interesting and uh, i see ideas like uh, we're creating ideas they're just uh, like um, good connections right now here and um, i have one question uh, which is born in my uh, when you were um, uh, speaking uh, right now um, because we do think, and personally, I, I also believe that the role of local authorities uh, with regard and with the work of uh, with the vulnerable people is very extremely important. And um, what do you think? Because you were speaking, you, you just thought um, said sorry that Icon Academy it's about people who have already knowledge. Um, we do know that uh, in uh, local authorities we have people who have knowledge in this area. How to include them in this Icon Academy, or how to communicate this information? This okay, this project exists just go, come, um, participate, and bring maybe the different voices of different communities you work with on the ground? It's mainly a question. <laughs> uh, to be honest, I have... Uh, <sighs> few, uh, <laughs> a little <laughs> confidence in public authorities as far as I've e experienced uh, as them. Um, let's be more specific. There are parts in what we can call public authority, the libraries or the, the street workers or social services, etc., who in the public sector can be our contact points if I will go to the local authority in my hometown, uh, Neuchâtel, and uh, ask a public uh, official uh, about this uh, idea, he will look at me like this. <laughs> he will not understand me, I think, the first two, three hours. So I have uh, you to use other access points. I have to go with a group of these people to the public authority and confront them. They have a problem. Why are not you not doing something for them? Or I go to the public library in uh, in uh, Neuchâtel, where I know there are people who work who are working already with migrants. They have a special sec a section in the public library with books from all over the world. So I have the sensi uh, sensitized people already in the public service and this could be my starting point my entrance point uh, making contact with uh, with them and then uh, discussing and developing specific offers based on an assessment of needs because whatsoever offer what is well intended but doesn't fit to a need from the community is not a need and is stupid in my eyes. So first make the assessment of existing needs in particular communities and then uh, look around who could be your partners to start it up. And then from uh, this moment, according to my experience, many things are getting a self-dynamic. And then you are on a good way, whether it will be successful is another uh, thing. But if you uh, identify the right entrance points, uh, it's already half of your work. Thank you. That's excellent. Uh, moving, obviously, as you as you mentioned, from confrontation to cooperation, basically. Uh, uh, I wanted to take a, a moment and say that we will be opening up to the audience to see what they have to also ask questions and interact in a minute. And 
we'll be moving on to another segment of, of this, dealing with sort of the cyber crime aspects and things like that, and moving over. Before, but before I do that, uh, Barbara, you've heard uh, many discussions from public libraries to how basically we work with local communities, and you know th th there has traditionally been sort of a lack of trust in a sense of how uh, governments can efficiently sort of deliver sometimes. But I found it very interesting what you were saying. You know, we should look at mobile, we should look at social media, and it looks like you know the government is trying to sort of not say come to me, but I will come to you. And that's an interesting dynamic change. So how do you feel about what you've heard so far and how is the OECD sort of working to try and you know, build the trust, say for instance, that a library has or deliver the sort of uh, 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 services that, that Wolfe sort of envisioned, uh, and uh, especially with respect to you know, uh, vulnerable people? Well, I, I, yeah, yeah. Oh, I think that, is it okay? I think that an important, um, a, a very important thing to do is to keep in mind that we also need to keep building the capacities of the government in a sense of, the capacities in the sense of awareness of the government. Um, I still, I, mm, I completely understand the diminishing, uh, the reasons for a diminishing trust of the public towards the, uh, pub when I say public, I mean citizens, but I also see, I also talk about civil society organizations and I also talk about international organizations vis-a-vis -vis governments, particularly because in the past uh, years we have experienced a number of crises, natural crises, social crises, economic crises, and many governments have failed providing uh, solutions and responses which were agile. If you want to use a very sophisticated word, but <laughs> which were basically real solutions, we want to be practical. And in these moments of crisis, of course, vulnerable uh, groups of people uh, people are who are vulnerable for many reasons um, become those that pay the highest prices for this. Um, therefore, from the OECD perspective, the work we are, first of all, we have um, adopted more and more an approach which is a so-called multi-stakeholder approach, which was not so um, um, diffused within the OECD in the past um, in the past decades, which means that in all our meetings, the uh, representatives of the civil society are invited around the table, representatives from the uh, private sector, because we think it's important that as governments look into the use of these new media to provide new opportunities, particularly targeting vulnerable groups, they don't have to forget that these are new tools of government, but those are not new tools for the private sector. So we believe that um, nurturing the uh, dialogue between the various groups and the um, public sector remains an essential tool to make sure that the strategies thought and implemented by governments actually take into account the right, uh, the right elements. Um, and let's not forget that even if we, um, in adopting the multi-stakeholder approach, we provide opportunities to a number of actors which are increasingly being engaged by the governments in finding solutions, um, the resources in many instances remain in the hands of governments. So I think it's the, and in all countries, not only in, uh, in uh, developed countries. And I think that's why it's remain, governments remain a key actor. And that's why I think in envisaging strategies that involve um, groups of the population, it is important also that the dialogue between the governments and the civil society remains an inclusive dialogue. So doesn't become a dialogue between the government and oligarchies, for instance, of groups of citizens which even vulnerable are strongly represented, whereas mm -hmm. other groups are not as strongly represented. Th thank you so much, Barbara. So practically what I'm saying, we need to pay particular attention and to empower able capacities of the governments on the particular issue, for example, inclusion of uh, vulnerable groups in the information society, using in a multi-stakeholder context and, um, and including all groups. Um, we would like now to open, because we are here and we are uh, we were organizing this workshop in order to uh, to have a discussion, and uh, we are going uh, to open the discussion uh, and to give the opportunity to, to to all of us, to participants, to share experiences and to ask questions. So please, if you have questions, just raise your hand and introduce yourself. And um, there is a microphone uh, that is available here. Um, hi, my name is Subhi Chaturvedi, and I come from India, New Delhi. I teach journalism, communication, and new media technology, and I run a foundation called Media for Change, which engages with new media, um, engendering the internet and youth. 
And um, there are a lot of things that have happened in today's session, and I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, there are several very, very critical points that have been raised, and I'm grateful uh, to listen to Wolf um, um, and you in particular. You've talked about access and dissemination, and I think it's a fantastic idea to include public libraries. But there are some very real concerns because um, in India, and we've described it as the first real internal threat to the democratic fundamental institutions when the recent ethnic conflict broke out. Um, my worry is when we talk about vulnerable communities, and there are many of them, so I'm speaking from the margins of the marginalized in India when we come from there, um, the issue of women and children in particular, I'm not even coming to older populations in India because uh, a lot of them are not on the net and a lot of them, even when they're uh, across socioeconomic classes, uh, there is uh, there are clear questions of identity thefts. I'm not even going to go there. But uh, when it comes to women and children in particular, a lot of um, occasions I found the government using these two stakeholders, very important ones, to bring in backhand regulation and not uh, facilitate positive obligation of capacity building. Uh, my questions really are, when we are talking about women and their representation, it's not just adequate to have them being represented, but how they are being represented, in what nature, in what capacity. And a lot of these uh, platforms are also platforms, uh, I'm so glad Barbara mentioned that, when we're talking about digital inclusion, we're also facilitating the same voices to be heard over and over again. So we come away with the impression that a lot is being said and a lot is being heard, but a lot of these stakeholders are not even here. And so I want to look at uh, including public libraries, the existing government structures, um, and there's not just this idea that the government needs to do something. A lot of civil society, um, I'm, and I've, I've heard a lot of complaints and a lot of crib saying, oh, we can't get there and we can't do enough. I also want to see this as a platform for celebrating the initiatives that have happened. So it's always easy for the industry to come together and take a position. But I've seen a lot of civil society mostly taking a lot longer to arrive at a discussion. And one of the great things that you're doing with the ICANN Academy, if that could be disseminated more, if we could share the learnings, and I know it's difficult to include academia and civil society in a platform such as that, but if the, a lot of sharing could happen. So my interventions really are around access, um, capability, transparency, dissemination, and also um, the one big issue that I have is when we're defining vulnerable communities, um, we need to go deeper because this is an easy tool to hand over um, and roll the red carpet for more regulation. So um, if one of you could take that up, thank you. Do, you have, uh, do we have answers from panelists? I mean, I'll take a crack at it. I think you're raising some very, very points. I, I think at the heart of it is if you have some success stories, then it helps identify what has been achieved to create this clarity uh, to replace the ambiguity. You know, when we hear I mean, like I, I disclosed at the beginning that I was not aware that this initiative has been taking place for quite a while. Um, and to me, the initial term of the word vulnerable automatically implies uh, women, children. Yeah. And that's natural. And I think, um, and also th then you look at vulnerable, then we're looking at vulnerable within Western society, which are a subgroup within those that have already been empowered. I, I take a, a, a different approach to things. I think any approach you take, if you cannot clearly identify how you're going to deploy it and how it's going to benefit and when and, and, and uh, the mechanisms with detail, then th at least you know at the end of the day what the plate is gonna look like, what the meal is gonna look like. Uh, it's gonna be very difficult. So we already can identify that the tools are, uh, not the tools, the means, could leverage, you know, uh, public libraries. But public libraries have a challenge, you know. Uh, last time I went into a public library was probably like, I don't know, a year ago. Well, I, I'll tell you why, because I wanted my daughter, who's nine now, she was eight at the time, to get into the habit so she can go and draw the book. Uh, it's part of the, so it's not habitual. People don't do public libraries. 
and um, what I'm trying to raise is that there are mechanisms that you can go to the heart of the issue. Like we use mobiles, even vulnerable people use mobiles. So perhaps a campaign, and how now we go into the specifics, a campaign that focuses on making those vulnerable groups aware that there is a solution. Now it could be a text message. Now maybe they're registered somewhere. You, it could be a text message, now they know. Now if you correlate this with a program with to that goes with, let's say, libraries, then when, you, when the vulnerable person or group go to the library, they're not met, like you said, uh, what do you want? There's already something that's already been prepared. And this is part of the coordinated effort. So, and I think if you don't put a timeline and I put a plan, it's like a, a war tactic, you know, uh, you're really not going to be able to deliver anything. Now we go back to the issue of the emerging markets. The majority of the people are vulnerable, and that includes the children, the displaced, the refugees. So I think in those markets, we may be able to actually factor in pr plans or programs that are generic but are fine-tuned that can serve the majority and the vulnerable in those emerging markets. Now we accelerate things. We don't have to go through the same period of, uh, like we've seen in the last 20 years in the West, it's taken us from the days of, uh, uh, early days of uh, telecommunication to today. In some emerging markets, five years ago, some of these people were not even connected, were not online. Today now they have mobile phones, they have tablets, and they are now they're online, and they're using the internet in, the o in English, not necessarily in their native language that we've been pushing for. So access is no longer, if you want to call it, access to the internet is no longer the issue. Not as much of an issue. Thank so. you, uh, Khaled. That's very, very helpful because you, you know, you talk about sort of using mobile, for instance. That's exactly how we need to sort of reach out to migrant workers, reach out to IDPs. I mean, that's that's they don't they don't have a place to go to, for instance, and don't have access of that kind. Subi, I think you made an excellent point that this should not be a segue or or a justification for the regulation. Uh, Barbara has a point to add as well. Please go ahead. Yeah, very quickly, how to make sure those initiatives pro mm, produce a value. Actually, my answer to you is to ensure that from a government perspective, a strong focus is on, is on the uptake of these opportunities that are provided, because if we provide more opportunities also through mobile government, for instance, but people, vulnerable people we're talking about here, don't use them, then what is the value we produce? And the second part of my answer is, therefore, focusing on the impact that these uh, opportunities provide, both on economic and social terms for these groups. And I give you two concrete examples, one from Colombia and the other one from Korea in the area of mobile government. So in Colombia, the government, and I'm talking about government initiatives here, but on which we are pushing the government to focus on the, on the impact and the uptake. In, in Colombia, for instance, um, there is a group of vulnerable farmers which uh, reside in very remote areas, which had been in, um, progressively being excluded from the markets because of their geographic location. And through a specific uh, service uh, developed on the mobile platform for them, they're now capable of uh, being, um, being constantly updated on the prices on the market. So they are not losing out of the fact of being outside of the information flow because of the geographic location. I pro can provide more details, but just to give you an idea. And in Korea, instead, mobile government has been used by the government to help women remain in the public sector workforce. Because more and more, they had realized that uh, given the complexity of Seoul, um, many women were leaving the public sector because of um, the difficulty of uh, merging the personal and professional needs. So these are two examples on how initiatives, as many exist around the world, have been focusing in particular on the value that these opportunities provide to vulnerable groups. Thank you so much, Barbara. I think it's very interesting. We will be back to e-government solutions and uh, discuss later on. I, uh, by the way, I loved the statement that uh, Khalid made concerning the we need to make available information to the vulnerable groups about the existing solutions. I think it's one of the important points from, from my perspective as well. We have a short uh, intervention from Anna. Um, Anna, please. I think it works. Yeah. Just no. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, well, um, it was very good that uh, I saw Yulia um, on the corridor uh, the because she called my attention uh, to attend this workshop that uh, I was not aware of. Um, because uh, it allows me to shine in on this uh, subject. And uh, it's very good well, that you are here. 
because uh, now I think that you can understand my idea of the telecenters. One thing that I would like to ask is whether anybody here knows what a telecenter is. Because in Portugal, we call it uh, the uh, ICT and Society Network, that is a network of telecenters that can be a library. We have lots of public libraries, local public libraries. It can be any public center that is supported by a local authority. So the government, uh, in our case, my ministry, we help them, uh, we, uh, we give them tools for them to work and to empower people. Uh, empower people uh, in, the, in the digital uh, era, right? Um, so my, my point here is the importance of these networks because there is a European uh, 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 network of telecenters and a worldwide telecenters network as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Anna. Do any of the panelists wish to respond and sort of supplement what Anna said? I think it was fantastic because it clarifies that you can use public spaces and even local authority spaces to have these sort of telecenters and anybody wanted to sort of add to that. Please go ahead, yes, Julie. Yes, I think it's it's certainly true that, that we there's a number of options on the market in some ways with in terms of space. Um, in the UK, telecenters partner with libraries and, and there's there's plenty of room for crossover. Um, where I would make the case for libraries in some cases, and accepting it's not the same everywhere, is just that sustainability element. Um, inside on the government budget line sometimes gives us a little bit of an option for sustainability. But I'm completely open to the idea that it's different in different places, and there's, there's many different sorts of options on the table. Um, the other thing I would say is um, just briefly the multilingualism and, and getting onto local content almost, because if we're going to bring people into contact with ICTs, it's, it's no good if all the content is in um, English. Um, we mentioned this yesterday, and, and again, going back to the point I was making about how you need to offer uh, users in libraries, vulnerable people, services that matter to them. You mentioned migrant workers, you mentioned mobile phones and, and getting to them. In libraries, we've discovered that if we offer um, migrant workers an ability to use Skype so that they can get back to their families, um, you know, you can see them, it's a tremendous boost to their engagement with ICTs. They can see the family, they can get back. And as my friend said yesterday, <laughs> you, you, you teach them to use Skype and then three months later they're blogging in their own language. So there's a, the, it doesn't happen all the time, but you can see that there's a, a connection there. So if you find the right tools, find the right connections, then you might also be able to get at that local content issue. Just something that I, wa I wanted to add, I, I, I think, hopefully it may be of relevance. Every region, every community might have its own challenges. So in some areas, you know, when you look at the blueprint of what you're trying to accomplish, the regions you're trying to accomplish it in, uh, the vulnerable groups or the uh, target market you want to ad address. In some areas, I think perhaps in some emerging markets, libraries may be solutions and sometimes they may not be the solutions. Uh, the, the library system in many emerging markets is not as widespread as you and I are probably familiar in the UK or in the US. So you may not have a library in every high street. So, so in that sense, uh, that actually gives you a limited uh, opportunity to engage. Then, so my point here is there may be the, uh, the telecenters that Anna was referring to. In some of these emerging markets, guess what? What sprung up like, like mushrooms is internet cafes. Now, those are a bit of a challenge because they are not under one hub. Libraries, one hub. Governments, you can get like a policy and a program and it's mandated and it's disseminated to all of them. Exactly. So each market has a challenge, but I think depending on what the objectives are, depending on what, your, what the priorities are being set in the way uh, uh, the plan is, then one can find what resources is available. I can share something else with you. In some emerging markets, the post office does function like a telecenter. So all of a sudden now, it becomes a point of access that if you can inform those who are vulnerable, go to this place, you may have access to this information to help you, all of a sudden you're providing a lifeline. 
Thank you, Khalid. We uh, obviously since we're running out of time, I'm going to move on to you know bringing in the cybersecurity aspect, although that's not the focus. But but Daniel, would you um, uh, let us know? We know that you work on cyber crime initiative in the program. There's a related to the safety and responsible use of the internet, and this is a very important component uh, in your program. Now to enjoy all opportunities that can offer internet and ICTs uh, for vulnerable people. Could you speak about your e-learning program uh, uh, that has been developed with uh, Deloitte, I believe, as an e-learning program? And, and is this program going to be used as a, a, a capacity building program for vulnerable people? And, and anything else that you'd like to add? Well, thank you for inviting me here today to speak about uh, the Dutch cybercrime program for the police. Um, just to give a, a, a short introduction and maybe uh, place why I'm actually here, uh, instead of uh, talking about vulnerable people, immigrants, very important as well. Um, we are a program that started in 2008, and basically the main idea that we have is that the digital world is all around us, and we as a police force have to deal with it. Not only the, the good sides of it, like the, the, the positive uh, sides it could bring to us, but also the negative sides that people are facing with. And of course, vulnerable people are part of that. In the context that we are, uh, that I am talking about, vulnerable people is again youth. Uh, that's a big target group for us. Um, so that's a, a kind of a short introduction. Uh, what I would like to say as well is that we would like to be a reliable partner with other uh, public and private organisations when it comes to dealing with the digital world. So it doesn't necessarily have to be cybercrime. Um, one point I would like to make before I start um, telling a bit more about the capacity building uh, initiatives that we have um, is that um, it, it is very important to have uh, the police as one of the partners. It's a very tricky discussion. Well, where do we come in? Do we wait until the crime is actually committed? Um, we again are talking about inclusion of immigrants, but once they are actually included, how can we prevent them? from uh, falling victim to certain cyber crimes or uh, any other crime with digital components. So, um, so that's one thing I would like to stress. We have developed uh, certain uh, capacity building programs in the form of e-learning modules, uh, again with private partners such as Deloitte. If you want to know a little bit more about, um, a bit more about them, I have uh, uh, an information leaflet in the booth of uh, NLIGF. Um, but just to give a small introduction of uh, what we do, for example, for our detectives, because we find it very important to educate our own people. We're talking about digital inclusion and digital divide. Well, um, I can say that from a Dutch perspective, um, we as a police for force have a lot to learn when it comes to the digital world and how we can effectively use it for our work. So um, one of the modules is for our detectives. Um, teaching them how to uh, engage in um, uh, their normal standard work and how to uh, use, uh, for instance, the internet to, um, to uh, research uh, uh, cases. Um, we also have an, uh, an, an e-learning module for the people that are in our front office um, that deal with the statements that people make when they come to the police stations. Uh, again, both modules are actually uh, very well, um, can be used very well uh, um, to also include the problems that uh, maybe specific groups in our society have. Basically, we are now uh, at a basic level to teach our own, our own people, when I talk about our own people, I mean the officers, uh, to get them on a basic level. But now I think it's a challenge uh, to, to to build up different modules when it comes to specific target groups in our society. Youth is one of them, but maybe we can talk about different immigrant groups that we have in our country, uh, the specific cultural things they have to deal with that uh, on in the digital world that may be slightly different than the uh, standard Dutch culture. Um, so that was an eye-opener for me, um, hearing all the discussions today, is that we can actually build up of, of, of that foundation and start to develop more capacity building when it comes to uh, the vulnerable people as a, as a specific target group. I think 
you so much, Daniel. I think it's very, and we believe why we propose this, um, when we propose to speak about cyber security and cyber crime, because we believe that when we speak about vulnerable uh, groups and people, they are, they are, they are more fragile. And it was uh, you mentioned this. Uh, we you even wanted to speak about threats. They are more fragile. They maybe need a specific approach. And um, uh, I'm, I just uh, have an idea that Warren, maybe uh, we discussed about these national strategies. Maybe we do need to include a specific capacity building tool for law enforcement working on uh, um, awareness raising and uh, prevention and cybercrime measures for this particular uh, group of uh, vulnerable uh, people. Um, we would like now to raise, we still have uh, two very big and very important issues we would like to raise. Um, we, we will open in a, in a couple of minutes the, the, the um, uh, questions and answers session. We would like to speak a little bit about multilinguism and the e-governance um, services and solutions. So uh, we do know that IFLA, uh, you have a specific program and you uh, raised this issue of multilinguism. Do you think it could be important, or it is important, to uh, have a specific approach once developing capacity building uh, initiatives for vulnerable people? I think I, I touched upon it a little bit already. I mean, IFLA, as I mentioned, has a members in 150 countries, and we have, as an organization, seven official languages, which is one more than the UN. So we already within the organization have enough problems of our own communicating our policies and our guidelines and our standards. So it is such an issue in our organization um, that it is actually one of our key initiatives in our strategic plan to disseminate within the organization in, in these seven different languages. So that said, um, when we get down to a more grassroots level, when we actually get into the libraries, well, I mentioned earlier on that I used to work in public libraries. Those libraries used to have books in Hindi, in the books of the, la of the, of the local immigrant population, so that there was an opportunity for, for information to be available in text. Now, of course, we're in a digital sort of area. And this, again, is where I feel that libraries can, can really add something to this debate, because with a library, you don't just get the physical space. You don't just get the terminal with the keyboard and the access to the internet, you get trained staff with expertise. And those people are actually well placed to offer advice on how to reach the languages in your, uh, the information in the languages that you need. Now this is not an easy thing to do because of course you're going to require some familiarity with languages yourself if you're going to access the correct sort of resources. And I'd be lying if I said there was a trained librarian in every single one of the 230,000 libraries around the world, because they're different in every country. But the actual concept of the library is to bring expertise and to help you find information. It's not like the um, internet cafe where really you go in and, and it's you and your own skills and experience against the computer. So um, in the initiatives that our members are undertaking in the communities, there's, there's a lot of attention played to local language content, but it's a big problem um, and it needs to be solved on a local level. So once again, local authorities, <laughs> local, 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 local level issues. Uh, thank you. Um, would like, um, can we have a point of view of Khaled coming from private sector working on multilinguism and you started already to have this exchange. Wh what is your opinion, Khaled? I add both uh, private and public, and I don't mean public, just government. And I mean uh, doing uh, uh, philanthropic as well. Um, a, a lot of the work on the issue of multilingualism and multilingual internet um, has been more of a, a direction and probably uh, a bit ahead of its time in terms of capacity building for emerging market citizens to be able and be engaged equally and in the same manner um, so that we have, going back to the issue of why we're here, a, a, a better format of internet governance and a better delivery of uh, uh, services that engage those citizens. So I think, I think it's definitely high level um, uh, item on the agenda that needs to be there. The specifics of what details it needs to include and who are the players I think we need probably to sit down and uh, crystallize that a bit better, depending on what's available. Because in some markets, you have uh, local governments and local authorities that are very advanced. They've done some very good things. 
You look at, uh, uh, at Egypt, for example. Egypt is very, very well developed infrastructurally in terms of um, um, uh, internet access. Now that also means that you could leverage this in, develop in, in, in delivering services to vulnerable people. Uh, internet access is very inexpensive. Uh, mobile cost is very inexpensive, so you can deliver. In other countries, it may not be as, as well developed, so it gives you challenges. So I think, again, it's case, uh, case by case, and depending on the uh, overall strategy of wha what we want necessarily need to um, uh, uh, identify as the achievables, then we can sort of like dissect what, uh, what would be required. That's what, uh, what I would say. Thank you. Go, going to the issue of e-government, I know we've discussed it a little bit, but specifically <coughs> seeing, seeing wh wh what can be done in this and, and looking at ideas at the Commonwealth, for instance, Lara, uh, uh, we know that ComNet has and Commonwealth in general has had very interesting programs related to e-governments and ICT sort of development in, 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 in uh, you know, as I said, uh, developing countries, in, in uh, indigenous populations, as well as small island states. And, and, and uh, so I wondered what you thought the role of e-government would be and how, what have you seen in your experience, for instance, uh, with respect to uh, including these sort of uh, vulnerable people into economic and social uh, system, you know, a aspects? Thanks. Thank you, Zahid. Um, uh, I don't think you can have a successful national e-government strategy without having provisions in there to ensure that there is access uh, from civil society and vulnerable groups to be connected to the internet. How is a government meant to successfully communicate with the public if they're not connected to the internet? So within that e-government strategy, there has to be uh, a targeted plan to make sure everybody's connected and has access. Um, so the Commonwealth Connects is uh, the ICT for development program that works on e-government across the 54 countries. I mean, uh, our work is primar primarily through ministries of ICT or uh, ministries of IT or whichever government department that has a responsibility for ICT. Um, so yeah, we, we, we generally work through um, uh, public authorities as well. Yeah. I, I think Stuart, you have a comment? Just a very, very quick comment because um, just there's, a, there's an important thing there, I think. If governments want to communicate with their citizens, those citizens need to be contactable uh, electronically, as it were. And in Denmark, the government, uh, from next year, every citizen will have to have an email address. Uh, and they are doing that by law, and they are using public libraries as the place, to, as the interface for citizens to get hold of that email address. So that's a really good example of using those public institutions to create that link between government and citizens. Uh, well, I think there are two components. Uh, one is the infrastructure, the access, whether you do it uh, the Danish way or another way. The other uh, important point for me, even mo more important point, is the content we would like to deliver. And I would like to come back uh, to the point uh, you said before. I think a very important element in all these programs or strategies are the sharing and dissemination of material, of content, of teaching modules or whatsoever. Because there is plenty of material existing. So we do, do not have, compared with 10 years ago, we do not have to d uh, spend much time on developing new material we have to uh, verify what is already existing, what can be utilized, and then sharing of publicly accessible material. Because you can have, uh, when you are using uh, uh, mobiles, what you clearly said, uh, a lot of programs are commercial, etc. apps, 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 apps. And we need to develop public material which are free of charges, etc., which can be reworked by the people, by themselves, 
for reuse by other communities etc so i'm a, a, a strong proponent of the creative commons license etc and i think under these circumstances we can do a lot of things uh, in the future thank you uh, yes sure w we are um yes quickly quick point and uh, do forgive me for forgetting to actually add it because it's really at the heart of what we're discussing uh, and I uh, uh, it's probably because of lack of coffee now it's on the <laughs> it's documented lack of coffee so I was like daydreaming is it oh I didn't see it sorry you had two cups you took my cup then um, in going back to emerging markets let me just bring you bring to your attention an event that happened in the last couple of years uh, not only in emerging market, but it has taken shape in also in the West, it's the Arab Spring. Forget about that it's, it's relating to the change for governments, whatever. It's about a new ethos of thinking by the citizens. When we're talking about an engaged, empowered citizen, what we now can take it to the bank, the citizen in emerging markets has showed that he, he or she are engaged. What is lacking is give them what to be engaged on. Now, if you thought that that's also in th that's only in emerging markets, look at the the West. In the West, we also had the Occupy movement, which mushroomed just because people were tired of the traditional politics that haven't really delivered much to them. So they also are engaged. So I think if we make the material and this go back to the to Wolf's uh, statement about the strategy. What is our target? And we are crystal on that. I think we will find that in many of these markets, the audience is not only receptive, they are thirsty for it. Um, I, I wanted to just uh, add something here. We, we'll, we'll come back to you as well. Then we have a question also here. Um, and I had, I had Barbara to sort of also intervene. But w you know, there, there was a discussion about the Creative Commons. And then we've heard about the Arab Spring and that we know how important access to data and information is in that context as well. So uh, looking at that and as, as open data, uh, Barbara, would you, what do you think about open data initiatives within government to make certain data from governments available uh, to the people for capacity building programs and empower vulnerable people, for instance? Yes. Yeah, I would like to, instead of giving like a flat answer on the value of open government data initiatives, because I think we all, uh, we're running out of time and I think we're all uh, uh, quite aware of how this movement is growing, ar growing around the world. I think that in order for these initiatives to provide value and picking up on what other colleagues have said here. I think first of all, we need to take into consideration what is the data, what are the data that citizens actually need and citizens actually want. Because yes, it's true that we are witnessing and it should be that way, an increasing uh, number of uh, public data sets being released and uh, in, in a format that enables the reuse for instance and that's one aspect which is key. But I don't think governments are still at the point of being able to understand on what citizens want to be engaged um, on. Um, and this includes also in understanding what kind of data sets citizens need to be able to reuse the data sets to develop applications which are actually useful. So it's not just an app, but it's an app that provides a service to a specific group of the population. And I think this is, uh, uh, so that's why I think uh, a lot of emphasis needs to be put on the open not on the data, which implies <laughs> looking at the formats, okay? Because I am kind of tired of seeing the multiplying number of uh, portals being put on place by governments thinking that they are implementing open government data initiatives, whereas this data is not free, it's not accessible by, anybody, by everybody, and is not utilizable free. And secondly, I really would like governments to become more and more capable of listening to the citizens. Citizens, yes, are being much more engaged. I just completed a review in, uh, in Egypt, or in the government review of Egypt, and it's been the most interesting exercise of my life because it is important to understand the, the value that the government has in the community, which has been shown through the media, but the, po the important is not the channel that was used. Okay, but it's the value that is out there. So I think, going back to my initial point, focusing on the impact, focusing on the value, still needs to remain the key, the key I think, uh, objective of government. And last point, on the strategies, I think that the reason um, many governments have tried to link the government strategies to the information society strategies was actually to try not to forget 
part of the picture, which is, for instance, access, enabling access. It's pointless to put opportunities in place if people cannot use them. But then we've seen a proliferation of strategies. And then there was an ICT strategy, an e-government strategy, an information society strategy, an internet economy strategy. So I think going back to a maybe simpler but more aligned and coordinated approach would actually make governments make the best use of the opportunities that many of them already have out there, but that still uh, leave many people excluded from the economic and social development opportunities. Th thank you, Barbara. So we um, will focus on uh, this proposal to stay open. Um, thank you so much. We have a uh, question uh, over there, and after a quick... Uh, yes. I'll make a really tiny Twitter comment. Um, so the question of being vulnerable, instead of merely tolerating the vulnerable, I believe we need to move the discussion a little more towards that of uh, the right of a secure cyber ecosphere as a right and an entitlement, not just tolerance. Um, the second on, uh, specifically on CBA, the, the Commonwealth uh, Initiative as a solution, the Commonwealth Broadcasters Association works a lot in developing and emerging economies. So if awareness could be created around those specific issues as rights, and I'll come to cybersecurity in particular. The Indian police, uh, we've been looking at reforms. They would first ask you if your car is stolen, did you leave it unlocked? What did you do? So we're working a lot on reforms. You know, an onus is, is a lot on you to prove that a crime actually occurred instead of helping and enabling. So that's one space where a lot of learning and a lot of sharing needs to happen. And emerging economies need to develop also their own solutions. Just the last point in terms of uh, um, uh, reforms, if we could take it across measures of health, education, and use any public platform, because India has just come out with UID. And if that could be synchronic with, with these issues and uh, just the specific issue of rights and entitlement, that's all that I have to say. Thank you. Excellent. Th that's, that's, a, that's a few tweets. It's fine. <laughs> Danielle, please go ahead. Well, in addition to the point you are making, uh, we are actually learning that um, not only uh, is your car stolen, but it's completely computerized, so there's no glass on the, on the floor, on the ground anymore, so there's no particular sign that your car is actually stolen. That's just one of the things that we learn our police officers. It's a computer now. It drives away just hacking in. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. We're not going to arrest you. Um, can make a uh, short comment on what Wolf said about capacity building and bringing together the initiatives. I'm, I'm more than willing to share all the information that we have on the capacity building things that we do. I think it's very important not to uh, try and, 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 and redo everything uh, every other year or so because somebody uh, thinks that it's time to, to make a capacity building program or something. The other thing that I've learned about uh, some of the evaluations we did on the e-learning uh, modules that we have is that it's very important for an organization to uh, have a specific culture and also uh, leadership when people do the capacity building and do the training and education that come back into an environment that they actually can, can, can use their knowledge and expertise that they've gained instead of just going uh, through an e-learning module and then, well, that's it, and go back to work again. So it, it's very important to have a certain, uh, um, uh, well, cyber sensitivity in your organization, as I might call it, uh, in order to, to teach the people what they need to know in, and, and use that in their actually daily work. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time, and basically uh, there have been cir circumstances where people have been thrown out of the room, so I just want to avoid that. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for the audience to take an interest, and, and for everybody. Please do um, uh, uh, take care to sort of come to the next IGF uh, workshop that we organize. I, I myself am impressed the fact that Yulia put this together and, and focused on this issue. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for the panelists and their time and, and very valuable observations. It seems like we're making connections, so thank you very much. <laughs>